fundamentally some sort of, you know, computational device, at least one that bears any resemblance to what we think about computation, I, I think is false. So other things we can say about these networks. They have, again, I'm, I'm saying things that ordinarily I would pick something and in a talk I would attempt to establish it. But again, I'm trying to paint a big picture. So uh, these networks have various sorts of plasticity. We all know they have reuse, redundancy, and degeneracy built into them. These are obviously global features uh, given by certain sorts of larger scale constraints. And these networks, of course, uh, one of the reasons people believe they crop up so frequently is they maximize plasticity and ro robustness, to use two biological terms of art. So to summarize, what makes such networks examples of contextual emergence? Multi-scale co-determination relations, global constraints, for example, small worldness, sensitivity to contextual changes at all scales, both internally and externally, multiple realizability of these networks, which others pointed out with respect to structural details, what we might call a kind of universality in biology, and the fact that what explains the power and the autonomy of these networks is the topology itself. It's the small worldliness that does the explaining here. Again, other people pointed that out as well. And we could talk, of course, we could talk about power laws and scale free and, and so on, but I think you get the idea. So um, I think imp implications, now I'm, I'll, I'll go beyond the brain. Obviously there's no, really no time to talk about this stuff, but uh, I think we're now also, you know, it's getting even weirder uh, because we're getting networks of networks, people working on meta networks to include social networks. So think about social science, obviously that would be a talk in itself, um, but people in social neuroscience are really using a lot of the same tools and mathematical formalisms to link the interactions of people, brains, and bodies. They take very seriously the idea that the brain, even these large scale networks in the brain are not enough to tell the story. You need to tell these brains network with other brains in culture and so on. And obviously I think it has implications for certain debates. For example, 4E cognition. Uh, I think all of this greatly supports the idea that um, again, without getting into the details of specific camps or whatever, that 4E cognition is on the right track about how to think about human beings, cognition and action or whatever. Uh, another implication uh, I think worth exploring is the debate in psychiatry between the biopsychosocial view, which is that the mo very often, obviously not all the time, a lot of issues or problems that we want to deal with in psychiatry are caused by, best explained by, biopsychosocial factors and interaction versus the biomedical model in psychiatry, which tends to focus on, you know, like a disease of the brain or whatever. So obviously there's no time to do it, but just to put this in your heads, I think an obvious case study here is addiction. Uh, I think when we look at the biopsychosocial uh, stories about addiction versus the biomedical models, not only the causal story, but the efficacy of the interventions, I think this sort of large scale network biopsychosocial story makes a lot more sense than the medical model. That's it, thank you very much. Okay, great. Um, so it's already 50 past the hour. So uh, what should we do? <laughs> I have lots of ways that we could direct this and if people want, I can direct it, but I, 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 I'd rather have it self-organize and <laughs> Do the, it's like the system we're studying, right? So, yeah. so do people, do people have a, I, what I would like to do is maybe give the chance, this is unfair to the speakers because they probably like really want to talk to each other and, and debate and whatnot, but I want to see if maybe the audience can suggest uh, some, uh, some ways that we could benefit from the panel being here and all of us being here online and and maybe suggest ways of discussing i mean again i can if if um there are no ideas i can just suggest a couple up. things but oh two three hands <laughs> i think, Sina, I think you you raise your hand you want to just well, uh, go forward please just um go ahead 
so one sort of um, direction that I think all of your stuff is, is really interesting toward, and it happens to be my favorite direction, so that I'm being selfish by even asking this question, but um, all of the things that you're talking about are, are thinking about what the right level is to understand certain types of causal or not changes. And um, so when we talk about changes, when we think about the brain, we are really interested in plasticity a lot of the time. We wanna understand what, what it is about the brain that changes in order to make this behavior possible or that behavior possible. And, and so there's always this tension, at least, so I'm, I'm a neuroscientist and I work with uh, neuroscientists at a lot of different levels, especially very molecular levels, but I'm an fMRI person. So I get into fights a lot about like what the right level of discussion is, right? And so like at what level, how do we decide? I don't think there's a right level, but, but how do we decide how to approach these questions of plasticity in a way that's logical, given the kind of um, systems that we're working with? So if that is a bad, badly formed question, another sort of way of thinking about it might be, it's pretty obvious, I think, that um, plasticity of, on color blindness, for example, would have one type of uh, way of understanding it. You'd wanna look in the retina, you'd wanna look at changes in you know, retinal circuitry. But face blindness would be very different. You'd wanna look at different kind of structures at different levels. So, how does one decide, but that's one very obvious example. How does one decide which of these, um, which of these ways one should be looking for plastic changes? And that's a practical question, right? Because we can do experiments and when we do them, we have already decided which level we're gonna be trying to look at. Does that make sense? Um, I'm happy to take a crack at that and then pass the baton to my colleagues. Um, it's actually something I've been thinking about a lot as well since I actually came from my work. My first uh, taste of neuroscience is actually in animal models looking at snoopy unit recordings. And then I you know, graduated to fMRI at some point in my career. Um, the, this is actually something I think we sort of touched on all four of us in different aspects, there is this multi-scale dilemma that we all kind of face in neuroscience and knowing how these pieces get put together. Um, and it's particularly problematic when you have, and I think Michael covered this quite nicely, that, that, that the wiring of these systems um, is very volatile, i.e. plastic. Um, and um, in my perspective, we've kind, of, we've kind of got trapped with using the term plasticity to talk about how these changes manifest because it's almost as if Plasticity is something that's out here and then gets invoked when things change in the brain. Whereas I think a lot of the emerging literature, um, both in terms of you know, even single unit recordings or dish work, um, all the way up to um, EG dynamics suggests that plasticity is pretty much ubiquitous, that it's always there. Um, and it's probably a good thing actually for our brains that we have this capacity to rewire on the fly. Um, the challenge becomes how do you control it so it doesn't go out of go, go crazy, and that's kind of where the dynamical systems theory comes in. Control theory that Danny talked about is also quite important. There is how does the system um, both allow itself to adapt, to learn stuff, hold that adaptation, but not adapt at a cost of losing what's already there. Um, so it's the the levels that we look at in terms of um, single units gives us some of the I don't want to use the word mechanism, but I can't think of another word. Sorry, Lauren. Um, but there's there are ways that single units will change their 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 affinity, and that gets cascaded up to uh, circuits and systems. And so that's I think where we want to look at how do you then transpire the multiple scales to see how you go from circuits that are rewiring on the fly to how that then gets transferred elsewhere. So you have this idea of you know changes that matter, time scale separation, time scale dependence. Um, those things are quite important in dynamical systems theory. They're also probably equally important in the brain. So using that to decide what changes are important at one scale to the next scale is probably a good way to try and sort of use that to, to filter, if you will, um, the changes. If we, if we stick to the explanatory side of things, I, I, I'm guessing, I'm assuming that while we may differ here or there, we're all some sort of explanatory and 
causal pluralists. So, I mean, what is there to fight about, right? Like, I mean, I think we all agree that, I mean, and there may be plenty to fight about in other areas, but I think we all agree that um, different problems, uh, different interventions, et cetera, require explanations at different scales and at different levels of abstraction and so on. But determining so. which ones, right? Determining for a given, that's that's what there is to fight about, I guess, <laughs> is determining well, which one, for this particular um, modification in behavior, where would you look? I think we can- Isn't that gonna be with respect to a particular problem or desire to intervene in a particular way, would you say? Yeah, yeah. It kind of gets back to, or maybe I should let Danny answer that, because I think that kind of gets back to where the control theory comes in, is that when you start, um, you know, looking at the system architecture and intervening, um, which at which level does the perturbation actually impact the behavior you're studying? Yeah, definitely. And I guess I also kind of want to know, I mean, so, um, Randy, you just said you didn't want to use the word mechanism because of what Lauren said, but but also what else do you call it? And Lauren, I want to ask you, what where is the where's the water flowing in the channel? Because sometimes the channels for us, their anatomical connections, maybe water flows sometimes and it does some one thing, but another time gelatin flows gelatinous something rather or bubbles um, and that does something else and so the what is actually in there matters and also the dam that broke that allowed the water to come or the bubbles to come matters too and which dam broke so I'm curious what you would call those I, I, I would still call them mechanisms but maybe that's not what you would call them yeah I think that there are going to be cases where there are differences in the entity that's flowing such that you need to take that into consideration and it's probably going to involve lower level more mechanistic details about that entity but if the, you know if you are interested in um why the fluid you have moves to location x and not location z there are many cases where you can have many different types of fluids you can have you know just the composition is microstructurally very different. And the explanation can be provided by the fact that, well, the constraint leads it to X and not to Z. So in that case, it's going to be the constraint that's more explanatory, but that just says that for some explanatory targets, the constraint will play a bigger role. And maybe in other cases, it is that triggering cause that, um, that is more explanatory and gets you what you want um, so it'll depend in part on the explanatory target. And maybe there is a way in which this connects up to Christina's question. And I, I think it's essentially um, almost another way of saying what Randy has said, which, so if the question is, at what level is the causally and explanatorily relevant detail? Well, one way to answer that is first pick your explanatory target. You figure out what you want to explain. Um, the thing that does the explanatory work is what gives you control over that. So the way that I understand causation is in terms of control. And this is um, perhaps also uh, compatible with um, right, other ways in which we've talked about causation. So a cause is something such that if you intervened on it or perhaps perturbed it, it should it gives you control over the thing of interest. So fix your explanatory target. Where's the, where are the factors that give you control over that? And whatever level they're at, well, there's your level of um, stuff that's explanatorily and causally relevant. So I guess the way to push back on the reductive picture is to say, look, this isn't a, you know, as low as you can go type of game. It's what gives you control. That's the kind of guiding rationale behind selecting the factor that provides the causal power, the explanatory power. Hazar, you, you, you wanted to ask a question, right? Am I getting your name wrong, right? You got it perfectly right, which is very, very rare, actually. Um, so that's a big congrats to you, Louis. Um, and just wanted to say, this is such a nice panel. I think this is my favorite panel on Zoom, literally the entire pandemic. So thank you so much for taking the time. I have a pretty big question that was briefly touched by Michael at the end of his talk. And that's, um, I've been really thinking about this like new emerging field of cognitive ecology, which is the idea that 
our brains adapt to particular environments. And so when we're thinking about causality, I would argue um, that the brain is not the first place to start, even though we tend to think that it is. We tend to think that it's, you know, neural mechanisms that then give rise to behavior, which then sort of form a society. But I think we can go back and it's really the societal adaptations which constrain the brain in, in important ways. Um, obviously not completely because, you know, all human brains have like similarities, which then give rise to particular behaviors. And so thinking about cognitive ecology in that way, what are your thoughts in how we can understand causality without starting at the brain? And instead the brain is part of the chain of, of um, causality. Well, I, so like you said, I touched on it at the end, but I mean, we have, and there are people on this panel that could say far more about this than me, I'm sure, but we have this whole area called social neuroscience, for example, right? Where yes, it's still hard-nosed neuroscience, but they take very seriously the idea that, you know, what brains are doing is about being, you know, networked in all kinds of ways in culture and sociality and so on, right? So, I mean, I think, uh, I think even, you know, mechanistically minded neuroscientists are starting to take this seriously. But um, I think that's what, you know, again, uh, 4E cognition, embodied, embedded, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, I think Tony, my spidey senses tell me that Tony Shamir is out there somewhere, so maybe he'll mouth off about this. But, um, you know, there's a whole enterprise, right? Uh, Michael Spivey's recent book, you know, which makes the point that, you know, people are really, you know, multi-scale networks, right? They're not just a brain or a body or a nervous system, but they're all those things and interactions with other people in a cultural and physical setting and so on. Um, and social neuroscience people are really trying to use formal tools you know, to the extent that they can to sort of get at that. So um, one of the things I'll, I'll say this and I'll shut up. One of the things I'm struck about is how much these ideas, which were once considered, you know, wacky emer emergence and holism are now pretty much, you know, look, look at, look at Barrett's recent book, Seven and a Half Lessons, right? What are the first lessons? It's all network. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Randy. Right. Uh, so this is like, you know, this is the kind of book we all wish we could write and collect on. Um, but look at the lessons from this person who is not, you know, not some holistic hippie. Uh, it's all networks. It's all about brains being wired together, sociality, and so on. So I, I think it's, I think it's out there. Anyone else from the panel want to chime in or? There, there is a, there, there is, it's certainly popular. And I, 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 the reason I have that book is I, uh, I know Lisa and she sent me a copy. So I was sitting at my desk. Um, but one of the challenges with, with, with doing this, and I think uh, we can talk about that it's an important thing to do, like the, you know, the mind is, or the brain is embedded in the bodies and embedded in the environment, is embedded in the social system and so on. The hard part is studying it. Um, and that's, that's where the challenges are still, haven't been quite um, uh, captured. So we can simulate that. I know that you know, the group in Florida Atlantic University and the complex system group did start doing that with, with social um, systems. Um, but it's a question of actually looking at the multi-scale dependencies uh, and knowing what, which scale interactions are, are meaningful, which is which scale interactions are not meaningful. And that framework, you know, the idea is there. I just haven't seen anybody really execute on it because it's a mathematically difficult problem. Thanks, Heng. You wanted to ask a question, right? Yeah, I, I've been, uh, I have several questions and they're in superposition, like in my head. So now it just, you measured it and, and it, it has been determined to be uh, <laughs> one particular question. Um, so I, I want to go a little bit orthogonal to the, to the discussion here to sort of see if we'll, we'll accept, ex, uh, expand the theme. I want to see what you think about the relation between the constraints or mechanism, however you want to really use a word, uh, with, with determinism. So I think when we talk about cause, we're thinking about in a determinist way, sort of implied, we made this change and, and then there is a determined outcome of whatever that cause is causing. But the, 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 the interesting thing about biology is all your constraints are interacting and it's not always seems like we have the 
right measure and experimental setup to completely determine the system. Uh, or we may measure too much with a lot of noise and we over-determine our system. And uh, there is a tricky issue when we're just thinking about constraints and how many constraints are involved. Can we start to talk about these causation in a deterministic way without considering what are the undescribed constraints there are? So this is a little bit nebulous. I'm just like kind of musing and talking to myself, but I hope that it lists some other like like electrons uh, go into the higher orbits of something in your head. Anyone wants to uh, comment or follow I up? I cannot resist to jump in, <laughs> okay, if I may. Please, please jump in. Um, I think we uh, insufficiently talked about something that I think is important. Uh, systems, complex systems are far from equilibrium. And uh, when Randy, for instance, see this beautiful symmetric network from the Pillai Gersa paper, and then show the symmetry breaking, something spectacular happens with very minuscule variations of a perfectly symmetrical coupling to a non-symmetrical coupling, dramatic change in the organization of the systems. And this is because the symmetric uh, topology of the symmetric architecture is a singularity and it vanish at the least variation of those. So with that in mind, uh, I think that when we spoke about causation, we need to be able to have uh, people like cause singular. Causations in complex systems is uh, complex, exceeds probably uh, desirable com cognitive complexity to articulate a relationship between something and a consequence. And when I want to think about co causation, I would like to say, there's this blah, 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 uh, proximal cause and this and this and this and the coexistence of this and this, which cause this event. So uh, this complexity of the uh, causal structure is poorly captured because we try to have singular cause and causes in the perspective of close to equilibrium or equilibrium homeostasis kind of explanations. I add to that. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Randy. Thank you. Um, I mean, the the there's a couple of ways I, I think about your question. One is, one is to think about the fact that the what's deterministic at one scale might be stochastic at another. Um, so, for example, the brain has a multiple time scales over which it it has evolved, right? Um, we have an incredibly fast microsecond time scale. We also have scales of years um, or decades where which things are changing as well. For most of our purposes, that that very, very slow time scale change is essentially deterministic. But on, at the next scale below, you have stochastic variations. So and then in, in that framework, you actually have probabilities of certain things existing or statistical likelihoods of things existing. Um, so you have sort of a deterministic architecture and then a playground within it that's actually more stochastic. And I think that really depends on the time scale you're looking at. Probably also spatial scale, I shouldn't just talk, talk about time only. But I think that's, that's for me, the, the dynamical systems aspects has that sort of multiple time scale aspect. And that's where the deterministic stochastic aspect comes in. Okay. Um... Anyone else want to suggest a theme for discussion or any? Uh, Johan, I don't know if you want to follow up on your. Yeah, I thought maybe. Uh, first of all, thanks for a, a great set of presentations. Um, I thought uh, it fitting with the, both of the last two comments, it might be interesting to touch on Judea Pearl's idea of uh, counterfactual causation. And uh, one thing that's sort of radical is that he kind of turns causation into a purely epistemological category where you draw a causal diagram and then you probe data. But there's a sort of tension with fitting that with the dynamical systems uh, approach. So have you uh, thought about how counterfactual thinking lines up with the dynamical systems approach or the mechanistic approach, which is not exactly the same? Thing? Yes. <laughs> 
have a, I've thought about it. Certainly, I, I haven't come up with a solution for it. Um, I mean, you can put it in the framework of work that, for example, Carl Friston and Rosalind Moran are working with the dynam um, dynamical causal modeling. Um, and then there you can test multiple instantiations of, of causal structures. Um, the, the challenge with those is in the dynamical systems framework, it's actually, you really have to kind of um, reduce the probability of certain architectures existing as opposed to having a, a yes, no answer, which is true for most statistical models. Um, it's even more so when you get into the case of, of um, nonlinear systems that so you have to first defy, first of all, find a way to identify the distribution that's usually like with some kind of Monte Carlo, like uh, multi, Markov chain Monte Carlo estimations, which allow you to decimate a very complicated distribution. And then within that, identify which causal structures are more consistent with the certain probability distribution. That's as far as I've gotten so far with that. Another point that this relates to is discussion of explanations that are non-causal. So there's a lot of interest in um, different types of explanations of course, and while you know causal explanation has been the main focus of philosophers for many decades, it's more recently become um, interesting to consider types of explanations that aren't causal and dynamical systems are often thought to play a part in these types of cases. So, I mean, Michael can say a lot more about this too, but if you think that there are topological or mathematical properties of a system that matter for explaining its behavior, it might be the case that it's not a causal explanation, but a non-causal one. And so it might not need to feed the Perl type framework, which of course is focused on causal explanation. There might still be a kind of interesting dependency relation, maybe also something that fits a kind of counterfactual framework. But if you think that causes are things that you can or should be able to hypothetically like intervene on or, or perturb, that won't easily fit with certain types of um, mathematical systems, or at the very least, that dependency relation is a bit different. Sometimes philosophers say the dependency relation with causal explanations is empirical. You learn about it by studying the world, where if it's um, a non-causal explanation, you don't need to study the world to know that this math uh, determines or explains this outcome. You just look at the math and you kind of uh, you kind of know you don't so the dependency relation is is maybe different but um but yeah that might be one way to think about the sense in which dynamical systems approaches are explanatory whether they provide causal or non-causal explanations yeah i i certainly agree with all that um the way i mean like e even on dynamical versus causal right you even so in some sense they're distinct right depending on what we mean by causal do we mean a mechanism? Do we mean a contiguous process? Blah, blah, blah. But um, oftentimes people in dynamical systems want to focus on the fact that it's not causal, right? That it's not mechanistic. It's this, you know, it's more like a differential equation or whatever. But even then, like even in physics, it gets weird, right? Like, you know, Newton said, I feign no hypothesis, right? He had an equation. He didn't have a mechanism. We still don't have a mechanism. Um, we have non-causal explanations in physics. We have conservation laws, Lagrangians, least action principles, right? Some people are, you know, so you're gonna have the same thing in biology in different ways. And um, I think, you know, my view is these things are all tools, right? I don't think that there's no magic in saying the brain is a mechanism or the brain is a dynamical system. I think that just reifies these tools we have for exploring these complex systems. But I think even in starker contrast to both dynamics and, and, and you were just talking about it, but in starker contrast to both dynamical and mechanistic explanation are what people are now call, calling, even, you know, Batterman, lots of people now are calling, you know, boundary conditions and constraints that, you know, we always talked about initial conditions as being so important, which you do in dynamics, obviously, but that we're missing the importance of these things that we relegated as merely background conditions. What I am calling, what I call contextual emergence is now being really important. So whether it's a topological property, it doesn't even have to be mathematical abstractor, right? Even very physical things can be boundary conditions or constraints. And I think it is a whole different species of explanation, but I think it all, it all goes together. I mean, causal modeling is great, but it, it's limited in various ways, especially like you said, if you wanna to try to intervene on something. <laughs> 
Can I ask right. a clarifying oh. question? Can I just ask a quick clarifying question? Um, which is that I feel that I'm not completely following that the dynamical systems approach is a non-causal explanation, which I think is what Lauren maybe said. Um, and I also think that the constraints, I think, I think that Lauren was showing in the talk that there's a way of thinking about the constraints of the physical connection as a cause. Um, and then what Randy and I often do is put a dynamical system on top of these physical connections. And it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the relationship between the constraints and the dynamics that you put on top that explain the thing that we're trying to understand. Um, and so both pieces have explanatory power. And I think both pieces, at least in our, uh, you know, kind of casual conversation, have components of cause in them. Um, if you put a different dynamical system on that wasn't related to how the brain works, that would not uh, explain causally how like activity flows from here to here in a in a nervous system, right? And if you didn't have the true physical connections, the actual conduits um, that are real, you have some other random conduits um, that would not be a, a provide a causal explanation for what you see either. So it's the dynamics, the dynamical system, and the physical conduits that together are two pieces of cause um, in in our casual view. I don't know if that. Um, yeah, let me, let me just, with the way both Mike and uh, Lauren are. Let describing. me just mention, can I, uh, Lauren, can I just mention one thing that, that I think is useful is that the way Danny summarized this is actually, it, it represents the way that a lot of computational modelers uh, think and they would not view their type of explanation, which is exactly in terms of how Danny was outlining as not causal. So there is a disconnect between the world I don't know if it's good or bad, but th there seems to be a disconnect between the world of philosophy of, of causation and the philosophical world and the way at least that the computationally or physics oriented people uh, describe and think about their models uh, that they don't even recognize their this, this description or that, that's not a causal uh, type of explanation. So I think that at the very least, I think that if we want to improve the dialogue between the sciences, we need to describe in what ways are we the computational, are some of the computational modeling people in neuroscience misguided in thinking that way, or that the meaning that the philosophical side of this world is adopting has this goal that it is or not shared with with the other camp, so to speak, because I think otherwise we create this disconnect that you keep on hearing everyone, let's say on Twitter, on other places that we talk, that's saying, oh, that's not a causal explanation. That's not a mechanism, you know, because you, I don't know, you, no matter what people think about Steve Grossberg's computational models, he wouldn't uh, view it as a non-causal description of I mean, he has equations and different uh, coupled equations to exactly explain this emergent behavior, right? So it, it, there's, I think, a disconnect that I think that we, we really need to, to I think, acknowledge and, and, and understand a little bit better because otherwise we just will keep talking past each other. I think you just yeah. have to be, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. So I, I that sounds, um, so that's really helpful to hear. And I think part of what will help is there's a little bit of backstory in the philosophy of science literature that explains why there's been an interest in non-causal explanation. So first, the suggestion or the claim is not that dynamical models, uh, whenever they're used, are always providing non-causal explanations. It's just that in some cases, you can use them to provide a non-causal explanation. Now, why is that interesting? Well, in philosophy of science, the dominant view since basically 1965 has been that the only way that scientists explain is causally. That is, there's been so much focus on causal explanation in my field for a very long time. And so 
um, there's been newer work that suggests that that's not quite right. And so in that work, they're trying to find, you know, are there cases of explanation in science that aren't causal? If so, what do they look like? So some of the, the cases that are thought to represent this are ones where maybe mathematics is used and um, in other cases, you know, there's topological approaches and dynamical systems type stuff. The claim is not that whenever a neuroscientist is using a dynamical type approach, they're always providing a non-causal explanation. It's just that sometimes, sometimes they are, and that there are some kind of variants of explanation that are provided in science where you don't need to know causal relations between systems. And one of the ways in which this is motivated is, suppose you have the same kind of behavior being produced by uh, various neurons that are totally different at the lower level mechanistic, you know, detailed stuff. So they produce the exact same behavior. If there's a kind of model, mathematical model that captures their shared behavior, um, there's a way in which that model can explain why they share that behavior, why they produce it, and it has nothing to do with their lower level details. Why? Well, because they're different across all of those systems. And so um, there's this, it gets into like a more complicated, and there's a lot more that needs to be discussed there. But um, the, the main things I think to highlight here is just, this is why philosophers are so interested in non-causal explanation, because if you can now show that, that that's a legitimate type of explanation, well, you've really contributed to the literature, which, is, which has denied that for decades. Um, and the type of example that, um, that Danielle's mentioning sounds like it does involve causal components and causal features. So that makes so that makes total sense. The other thing that I'll mention is constraints. I think there are different types. So I think there are causal constraints and I think other constraints aren't causal. So mathematics can be a constraint. Laws of nature can be a constraint. Those are two types of constraints that I think don't fit a causal framework and they figure in explanations. Um, and in fact, they get more attention in the philosophical literature Sometimes people, Mark Lang has a book that's almost, well, half of it's on constraints and they are non-causal things. So yeah, I totally agree. Um, I do think it's helpful to, um, and I would suggest that they're just different types of constraints. Some are causal, some aren't. And then there's a lot more to be said about how you, um, what it means to say something is a constraint versus not. What's the difference between a run of the mill cause versus a causal constraint? So there's a lot of, cool stuff here, but yeah, I totally appreciate the sense in which it seems like there's a disconnect. Hopefully that helps explain part of philosophers' fascination with, um, you know, non-causal explanation. Um, it's in part due to this kind of history in, in our field. Yeah. I, Go ahead. Oh, I just want to pick it back on that. It's just adding my comments related to my early questions about determinism and that sort of um, resonate with the, this, the disconnection of what I call constraint and causation in dynamical system versus what might be generally considered in, in broader areas of uh, causality studies and philosophy. And uh, what exactly I meant was what, what Danny was talking about, the, um, when I consider a, the narrow sense of having a dynamical system, we consider the strong effect of cause is given this dynamical system of certain dimensions. I have the initial conditions of certain dimensions, the current state caused all following states. And that's a very strong sense of causation in, the, in, in time, sort of the, the current state determine all future states of the system. But what I mentioned about the causation and determinism was when I learned more about dynamical system, although it's not that easy, the, there are a lot of requirements for existent uniqueness of, of the solution. So there's a requirement for how much information you have to have before you want to determine the trajectory, exactly know the sequence of the event. But if we think about determinism not as a, a event and the following event, then we have a little bit more room to think about causality. We can think about this set of constraints or the structure of the brain determine the set of, or the, the manifolds of all possible trajectories, that would be also a strong determinism 
uh, and, and causal, but not in a, the time is kind of factored out of this because you know Unger can claim the sequential cause of time because you don't have enough information, for example, about the initial, con initial condition uh, or you don't have enough uh, equations and this is, et cetera. Uh, so yeah, I just, I just try to like add on that point. I, I just think you have to be really anal about what you mean by words like dynamical causation, computation, or whatever. Because, you know, look, so typically when we make this contrast, what do, what do we mean by dynamical explanation? You start with it in, you know, you start with initial conditions and use some set of differential equations, right? You could, you could talk about that in terms of causation if you wanted to, right? Like, like you just did in your question. Um, you know, it determines deterministically, right? Whether it's deterministic or stochastic is I think a, an orthogonal question, but it evolves the next state in some way. But usually when people in, in neuroscience or biology are talking about causation these days, sometimes they mean something like causal modeling, which is mathematical and computational, but often they mean something like a mechanistic explanation. So when people in certain schools of extended cognition wanna say, you know, it's more like a dynamical system than a set of mechanisms. They mean to talk about an explanatory method that involves differential equations versus, you know, localization and decomposition or whatever. I don't, you know, I, I know we get in a that's lot why, of- That's why I get confused because you can have differential, differential equations are just differential equations. You have to differential yeah, equations right. of ions and of, sure. of whatever you want. I mean, it's like, that's what math I is, right? Understand. Math it's is like designed to model right. anything you want. Yeah. Right. So, but that's why I get really confused because everything has to be dynamics. Well, think about think about like uh, network explanations, graphical explanations, right? I mean, one of the things that that we don't like about them is they're pretty static, topological. You know. So, what do you want to do now? You want to, and this is what people are working on. You want to put dynamics on top of that, right? Yeah, but so, that's what a whole field of, of computational neuroscience and neural networks has always done. I mean, right? It's yeah. not like that we need to go and create something. I mean, obviously, network science as a field can expand and create some all sorts of hybrid ways of looking at dynamics. That's not to say that it can't, but this other language has existed for 50 years, right? That people have looked at networks that are dynamic by definition because they are, the elements are defined via differential equations. Yeah, we have computational models of multi-scale networks that have differential equations and all kinds of other tricks in them. So I, maybe if there's, I understand that people are fighting about old school isms like computationalism versus dynamical systems account of cognition. You see what I mean? Like maybe people are hung I up see, about, okay. I see. you know, being representationalist, which is a kind of mechanism or something. But that's why I say on the explanatory, if we just focus on all the explanatory tricks, I'm not sure what there is to fight about, right? We want to use all, we want to use, we want to learn all the micro details that go with these networks as well. It just turns out, right, that, you know, a lot of these, as we've been saying, these network explanations transcend, you know, uh, mechanistic details. I think Danny was going to follow up. Yeah, I just think that when you put a dynamical system on top of a sparse network whose nodes have anatomical locations and whose edges have physical placements in an actual like duct system, um, then it you've you've added the localization and you've added some of the composition to the compositional pieces. And so then I think that it becomes not like dynamical systems E in the sense that dynamical systems is has been used for a really long time before the networks were sparse and there were anatomical locations of the parts. It's also not like network science alone either because network science is is about statistics and the sort of just the topology but once you have something that flows on top of something that's sparse and physically localized then you you get different kinds of explanations that in, in my mind um that are not really possible to get in the other two sides right and that's what i feel like is maybe I'm not sure how that is discussed on the philosophical side, but that's definitely where, where a lot of the computational neuroscience is going. I, I agree with everything you said, except the part about localization and decomposition, because you can put the flow in there and it doesn't entail that, right? 
Well, so, but the localization is that the nodes have physical locations, as do the tracks. Well, sure, you can always you can always make the nodes. And first of all, nodes and edges can be explanatory and not have any obvious referent. Or you can make them functional. You can make them structural. You can make them represent specific components or whatever. But, um, but just you know, putting the the components in there doesn't take away from the fact that these the determination relations, right? And the difference in time scales, as Randy was saying, is multi-scale inherently. So it really, I don't, I mean, you, we're not going to settle this, and I've argued at, at length, but I really don't think it looks like localization and decomposition. And I think more and more mechanists, Bechtel included, it just admit it. They still want to call it mechanistic, but they're willing to concede it doesn't look anything like what Craver and others were talking about. Johan, uh, you, Johan, you still have it. Uh, you have it yes. up. Um, yes, I thought that this would be a, a good place to insert something that Michael already mentioned, which is Robert Batterman's ideas about uh, singular singularities in physics and how, how they have both a causal and potentially mechanistic explanation, but they don't look like mechanisms in the traditional sense. So he makes a big deal out of the idea that for many emergent phenomena in physics, and in his case, he claims all emergent phenomena in physics require taking the uh, n tends to in infinity limit, uh, where you get some kind of singular phenomenon which requires renormalization, group theory, etc. And most people would treat that as some sort of epistemological limitation of the science. But the but the truth is that those theories are some of the most mathematic uh, accurate theories in terms of agreement between theory and uh, experiment. So. Um, for the for dynamical systems people, uh, it's not that easy to say that these sort of purely ma math seemingly mathematical uh, phenomena aren't mechanisms. Because if you're if you're broad enough in what you think, then it may be that simply the scale of a of a network counts as a mechanism. But then it becomes a kind of universal mechanism. I don't know. It, it, uh, we're puzzled, so I think that. Uh, <laughs> I make one more comment. I, I, yeah, I think. I, I mean, I don't want to keep people for too long. I mean, I, I'm happy to stay stay on, but I I, yeah. I do I do appreciate that people have a. Uh, one of the things uh, that's interesting for me from this, and I and I have to go. I should go have to go buy, buy some groceries because I. Cause <laughs> um, groceries and all sorts of things. It's my so turn to do grocery shopping. Wrap it up in like five minutes or so. I mean, I don't. But I'm, I love to. I can just stay on here for just yeah. listening to you guys for a long time. So it's very clear that one one of the benefits of these kinds of discussions, and I appreciate that, is that, that we we are uh, sort of dancing around the fact that we use terms quite differently sometimes. And the one that just came up was mechanisms. And certainly, uh, you know, I, I work in a in a uh, academic health science center, you know, geriatric folks. So of course, mechanisms for me in research is actually what pill do we need to cure Alzheimer's disease? What molecule do we need to target? That's the mechanism we're looking at. It might be completely fallacious, but that's sort of what we call mechanisms in that case. And that was kind of what Lauren was saying is uh, is the is the history of of looking at causality and mechanisms. And it's probably it's, it, it has impeded us, I you believe, in terms of going forward. Or... Yeah. So, um, and I then think the other that causality as I, well. Uh, may say something that Go might ahead. be a little controversial, and maybe he should be here uh, at some point. But uh, it, it seems like it, it seems like that um, a lot of the philosophy. Maybe this is also how it is in neuroscience, but it seems that a philosophy. Uh, and maybe I apologize in advance if I'm out of place here, but it seems that a lot of philosophy sometimes takes one person's view really seriously, and that generates an enormous amount of um, energy, either for or against. And as an outsider, it seems that, I don't know him, I mean, it's probably his great work, but Craver has set the agenda of thinking of mechanisms for a good two decades <laughs> and you know you see all people citing a 99 or 2000 paper uh, that he has and um it, it seems that sometimes that the 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 the, the, um, the debate becomes more about a, a type of definition or type of approach than yeah, I don't know if I'm explaining this right, but it, it, it seems like it, it, at some point it seems to start not connecting as much to 
to, to information that could be very, very useful, for instance, like neuroscience or physics or chemistry, or, or maybe this is just a, a, um, a misunderstanding from my part, but it, it seems that it, it kind of, it sort of like feels like it turns into itself as opposed to going outwards to connect with other things. But I, I think that might be a, a mis misrepresentation from, from an outsider, of course. But uh, like you said, so that's why there's so much interest in non-causal types of things because it pushes back on this notion that has gained so much traction. But but I don't know if this- Yeah, is I mean, it seems like it's probably important and most people would agree uh, I, that a philosopher- I can't hear you. I'm not, no, I don't know if others can hear you. Can others hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Okay. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, Luis, I think you couldn't hear Randy a little bit too at the end. Um, yeah, so we, I think, should want philosophers of science to care about what scientists are actually doing, um, but they need to do more than that. Mm -hmm. We don't just want them to be science reporters. If someone's going to describe what type of work a scientist is doing, we should have the scientists do it, not some, you know, random philosopher who, like, you know, might not have a serious background in that area. So, you know, philosophers of science are, are they need to do more than that. And they're often addressing different types of questions. And some of the questions that are coming up are, you know, what is causation? What, you know, what do we even mean by that? And, you know, it seems like an account of causation should accommodate scientific practice. If philosophers come up with an account of causation that makes no sense of how scientists use the term or how we use the term in everyday life, that should be a problem. But scientists don't always agree about what's causal and what isn't. So a philosopher should come in and say who's right and who's wrong. So you might think that there's a sense in which a philosopher of science, if they're doing strong work, it's both descriptive of science, but it's also normative. And they're also saying, no, that's not a causal system. You shouldn't define causation that way, where that experiment isn't giving you what you think, you know, you want. And, you know, if you look at the history of science, it gets, it's easier to sometimes, you know, see these examples. But, um, but yeah, some of the yeah. questions are just, yeah. what is a mechanism? How should it be understood? Sometimes we're just using mechanism, and it just means causation. It just means causal stuff and causal system. And so this can get really confusing, because, you um, in philosophical context, that happens too. But in other cases, mechanism is a very particular type of causal structure. So um, yeah, philosophers are often more focused on being, you know, clarifying what these terms mean. And um, yeah, oh, I'm the first, still do yeah, no, I'm, I'm the first to, to completely agree with what you're saying. I mean, I didn't mean it in that sense at all. In fact, that's the goal of having these kinds of discussions, right? It's, it's actually the need for, for neuroscientists, in my view, to 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 have a much more conceptual, philosophical, theoretical understanding of of the type of activity and, and goals that they engage in, so I, I'm completely completely agree. But but what, what I'm saying is that I think that philosophers can, again, I can naively, obviously. It would be it's it, I think it would be useful for the for the for, for, for philosophers to to understand the kinds of issues that we've been discussing here from our side of the, the neuroscience of the kinds of confusion about in what way is it causal or non or, or not and and mechanistic and so on because in in the end neuroscience and science is all about trying to understand some form of regularity that we can describe in terms of causation or what have you. So if we can better understand and describe and, and, and conceptualize the types of activities that we're engaging in, then, then I think obviously that's exactly what we want in the dialogue, right? So it's, it's I didn't mean to imply at all that, that it's like, it's closed in and into itself and not useful. It's actually, how can we make it even more useful both ways? I, I think one way we can make it useful is not only or primarily, you know, normative stuff, that's certainly part of it, but, um, you know, we learn these sciences in part because just as scientists do in part, 
because we want to know about the nature of reality, right? So, and we want to do that based in science and not, you know, analytic metaphysics or pure reason or whatever other derogatory things. Scholasticism, I believe, is the word I usually use. Um, but so, in other words, I want to have discussions about the facts and what the data actually implies. So, for example, I really think, and I've argued at length, of course, that localization and decomposition just is not what the data supports at all. And the picture of levels and constitution and all that, and there are lots of other people with me, Alan Love and loads of other people, and even now a lot of mechanisms. And this is what I mean about the danger of the normative descriptive thing is, um, I have debates with mechanists. We both lay out a case, we agree about all the facts now, right? So they are willing to admit it's not localization and decomposition in the old school sense. They, they wanna have a fight about, but it's still a mechanism. So they've redefined the word mechanism now more broadly, right? Um, and they're okay if it's not even reductionist. Uh, some of them like the word process. They don't like the word emergence or whatever. Those are the sort of discussions I personally have no interest in, right? You know, if we agree about all the facts, who cares what we call this stuff? So for me, that's the danger of, uh, you know, that's the danger that philosophers get into, right? Those sort of terminological discussions. And for me, I sometimes think the terms matter because I think mechanism is a term that we use to refer to a particular kind of causal system in something like pathway and something like cascade. There are different terms that pick out different causal systems. They're often associated with analogies things that connect that up to something we're familiar with in everyday life, a machine, a roadway, um, snowball effect, avalanche effect, cascades, ripple effect. So, but that's in the space of causation. So, and that's a place to say like, you know, if you think all causal systems are mechanisms, then you, the, the term is meaningless. It's just, you know, you might as well just use causal system at that point. But that's not a good idea because we think mechanism brings something, we think it means something more than that. When you say mechanism, you're really giving me some kind of fine-grained detail, maybe a how, like how did that cause produce this effect, a mechanical relation, push-pull. Um, so um, yeah, but understandably, some of these discussions do spin off and they remain in like philosophical circles where they, they can surely seem like they're a bit distant from the science they were intended to capture in the first place well or i also think that it's it's just that trying to learn the um the the uh distinctions that philosophers have been making that's not something that all scientists are trained in or know so it sometimes is also just understanding the differences in in terminology um and i feel like i'm still a little bit stuck and maybe we can follow up on this later but on when you do have a pathway where and there is something that flows along it maybe the how is the fluid dynamics um, which could still be at a pretty high level, almost at the same um, scale as the conduit itself. It doesn't have to be like micro scale or multiple scales down from where where we're talking. So I, I'm still that, I'm still stuck there, but I feel like I know that we're get running out of time, and maybe we should um, rejoin again uh, later at some future time and space. Make a final comment. I'd love to chat with. Danny more about that and many other things at some point um, and everyone else too. Um, yeah, Ming Sing, you had, a, you had a comment that you wanted to make? Yeah, I just want to make a final comment, like a lay person of mechanism. I, I still like, I'm getting more and more confused about what's a mechanism, but then I think about um, more on the layman terms, uh, I think about mechanism as intrinsic and multi-scale concept. I will have to think about what mechanism explain what microscopic property of the system. Uh, there is not a mechanism for being. There's a mechanism for a clock, for example, but the clock is performing a certain function and there's a mechanism for it. And if the conduit conducts water and that conducting water is a function for it. So it's intrinsically like a relational between one skill and possibly a, a, another skill. Uh, so, it, or, or more probably gen more generally a function and the implementation of some sort. So we, we can probably not talk. Yeah, I would just like a thinking about Heraclitus and 
we step into the same uh, uh, the same river and different water flows. It's sort of well, there's a different version of how he actually said that, but the, the idea is at one scale this is the same river, and another scale it's different water flow. And what is exactly the thing that we want? Do we care about the function? Does the different water carry different information? And uh, it is is well, it's the framing the question we really want to ask and uh, change how we think about that. Anyhow. Okay, uh, I think that um, there's lots that we can continue talking, and I think this is um, I, I, it's so fascinating that, that I, to me, I'm actually curious why neuroscientists practicing neuroscientists are not more into these kinds of things. And I was always very puzzled as as why they don't they are not puzzled about these foundational things. So I I'm very uh, glad that we could discuss some of this and, and hopefully continue the, the conversation. I would really love to find ways for us to, to cross fertilize and, 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 and build bridges and discuss and, and make progress. And, and I disagree a little bit with M Michael was saying earlier that we don't have things that we disagree on. I think there, there are going to be lots of things that we will disagree. And I think that will be great to clarify terminology, clarify the issues even that we as, as practicing neuroscientists uh, can, can benefit from. And, and likewise, our either expanded or myopic view of the scientists can inform also some component of, of, of the philosopher's outlook on this, which is obviously not the whole thing, it's not about making this mapping one to one, but it, it, it definitely, uh, hopefully also in, is informative. I think that uh, that will be a wrap. Um, Thank you so much, Luis. This was, this was wonderful. Such a great Thank session. You, Thanks, Thanks for the discussion. Everyone. I'm gonna try to, I'm gonna post it very soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.